flow control part one you know a very important feature of any good programming language is the ability for you the programmer to make decisions in your code and then execute different paths of code based on an evaluation of a condition and what we're going to use in Java to do this, to help us kind of determine the route we're going to take when we come to a fork in the road, is we're going to use control statements. And specifically, what we're going to talk about now are decision statements. And there are two types of decision statements found in Java, the if statement and the switch statement. They basically give us this logical path of making a decision. Let's, let me go ahead and flowchart that for you here. Here's what I mean by making a decision or having some kind of flow control or determining a path of execution. So your code runs, okay, and a decision is made. Something has to evaluate. Let's say the age of a customer or the dollar amount of a value, you know, is it greater than a certain value or is it less than? Is something true or is something false? And basically what I have with flow controls, I can kind of have a decision that's made and then execute accordingly. If it's true, execute that and then resume control. If it's false, execute this and then resume control. Now, sometimes I could just basically ask if a condition is true and just move along and not really care about whether or not it's false. Other times I can ask if it's basically not true or false and just kind of go along that path. So let's start digging into the code and checking this out a little bit deeper. I'm going to begin by opening up Notepad and creating a new class and we'll call this class flow one so i'm going to create my public class flow one and i open the curly brace and i minimize that and it's really important that you watch me do this over and over again because this is the essence public static void main capital s string args and we will be explaining all that stuff to you as we go on, this will make more and more sense to you. Okay, so here we have the classic, uh, you know, template of a class. I'm going to go ahead and save that in my flow directory. So navigate to the flow, and again, remember, it has to be the name of the public class. So flow1.java. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply declare a variable. I'm going to create a variable called int x, and I'm going to assign it the value of 3. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a simple expression, and I'm going to say if x equals 3, system dot out dot println something you know like x equals three okay so if that's true print it out so I'm gonna go ahead and save that and now I'm gonna open up a command prompt I'm gonna start run CMD I'm gonna compile my application Java C flow one dot Java and then what I'm going to do is go ahead and run that here. When we finish up, good, Java flow 1, and we get x equals 3. Let's take a look exactly what's going on here. Okay, notice how I used a variable. I declared a variable x of type int. Remember, that's the data type. And I used a single, exclam uh, a single equal sign. A single equal sign is assignment. Okay. Is assignment. Here, I'm using a double equal sign. And this can get extremely confusing. Remember, these are operators. The single equal sign is the assignment operator. The double equal sign is the 
evaluate it's a comparison operator so double equal sign is a comparison operator and it's basically testing for equivalency operator okay let's take a look at the basic syntax of the if statement you say if lowercase if then in parentheses you have to put in some kind of a condition that will evaluate either to a boolean expression of true or false true or false and then immediately following the next statement is the statement that will execute if it's true or false as I'll show you with the if clause here so I'm gonna change this to four I'm gonna save this and I'm gonna throw down another line here just system dot out dot println I'll just say you know done all right so let me save it and let's go back and recompile it and then we'll re-execute it let me find my command here re-execute that and you can see that it says done now I'm purposely showing you the confusing syntax first some of you are going oh geez great thank you well it's important that you see the confusing syntax first because then the way you can write it using curly braces will hopefully clean it up and make things more clear and let me just give you a side note for those of you taking the exam you have to know all syntaxes inside and outside okay so the rule of thumb is that if you have one statement immediately following your if statement you do not need curly braces the curly braces are optional if you have one statement they are optional however they are highly recommended now if you have multiple statements after an if statement then what you will do is you will go ahead and you have to it is not optional at that point to use the curly braces so you could see here I put in the curly braces let me go ahead and save this and I'm gonna compile it and run it again and you'll see you know you're basically not gonna get any difference here so I've got done here X is still equal to four which means this is evaluating to false okay so now what I'm gonna do is let's let's go ahead and print the results of that equivalency test there so I'm gonna do a system dot out dot print line, print line x equal three and you'll see that we're going to generate a boolean statement here so let me compile that remember the double equal sign is a test it is not assignment I'll prove that to you here in a second you can see that we're not printing anything out because x equals four still so it's just saying done so let's go back in here change that back to three I'm gonna save it we'll recompile and then we'll go ahead and execute that again and now look at this this is curious notice how it's saying true well did I anywhere write the word true I, I, I didn't I didn't type the word true why is it saying true the word true is coming from here this double equal sign is evaluating it's doing a test it's asking the question is X the value of three is X equal to three in a value sense if so then it is true and that's why you're seeing true come here now system dot out that print line the word done here that executes whether or not it's true or false that will always happen it's it's not really even part of the if logic it's the if statement finishes here and this will execute 
no matter what. Now, what if I would like to go ahead and make a decision of if something is true, execute it. Otherwise, if it's false, execute something else. So let's take a look at that scenario. All right, I've gone ahead and cleaned up my class, and let's create another uh, variable, int x, and I'll assign that the value of 5. And now I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to say, if x is greater than 10, and I'm going to start using the curly braces, even though I might have one statement here. Go ahead and system.out.println. We'll say something like, oh, x is greater than 10. Print that. Else, okay, this is what's going to happen if the if boolean equivalates to, if this boolean expression in here equivalates to false, else system.out.println x is, now, am I going to say that x is less than? No, because I'm not sure. All I know for sure is that it is not greater than 10. Okay, it's important to see that just because this evaluates to false doesn't mean that x is less than 10. We, we don't have enough information to be fully sure of that. Now, no matter what happens, this last statement here will always print out. You know what else I'm going to do? Let's, let's go ahead and throw this in here just so we could see the outcome of the Boolean expression. So I'm going to do a print line of x greater than 10 here, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to just do a quick copy and a paste down there so we could see the value. So let me go ahead and save that. Now, as I compile this, take a look at this, kind of imprint this into your brain, and try and figure out what's going to happen. Okay, you always want to try and do that. Always try and guess what the compiler or, or the outcome of the application is going to be. I mean, what do you expect to, to see here? So I run the program. Okay, so here we can see that we're seeing x is not greater than 10, the word false and done. Well, why? Let's, let's take a look at that. x equals 5. Is 5 greater than 10? It clearly is not. So that's why I'm getting the statement x is not greater than 10 down here, down on the bottom, okay, x is not greater than 10. Now, did any of you at any point here see me type the word false? Do you remember seeing me do that? No, you didn't. It, this is producing false because this greater than symbol here, this is an equivalency. It, it's not the equivalency operator. That's the double equal sign, but it's like it. It's a comparison operator. Now, notice that no matter what happens here, it's, it's done. This always prints. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this 0, 015. Okay, so I'm, we're going to do the greater than. And I'm sure you're already seeing, oh yeah, I know what's going to happen. It's, it's greater than 10 and true. Well, let's see if you're right. So I'm going to go ahead and compile that. And then we're going to run that. And we get x is greater than 10, true, and done. Excellent. Again, this is what's producing the literal words true here. Do not confuse that. Some of you might know what a string is, a literal text, character data. This is not a string. This is a Boolean data type that's being produced. All right, now, here's something interesting. I'm going to make x equal 10. Okay? Now try and guess what's going to happen. Let's compile that. Compile it. And I'm going to run it. And the false happens. Is 10 greater than 10? No. Is 10 less than 10? No. 10 is equal to 10. So technically speaking, it's false. And therefore, the false or the else clause is happening. Now, if I were to go ahead and change the operator, and throw greater than or equal, or, you know, for that matter, less than or equal. Let's go ahead and recompile that. 
and then I'll run it, try and guess what's going to happen. Here you can see the false is happening. Why? X is greater than 10. All right. Because, notice what I have here. I would have to go through and change these also to equal. So this is interesting. What's happening is, is the first part is true, right? Okay. I knew this was going to kind of be a little tricky here. X is greater than 10 is showing. Now, the, the reason why it's showing is because this is evaluating true, so this is happening. Now, what I should do is say X is greater than or equal to 10 here just to accommodate, you know, my new test. And I should throw an equal sign in there too. And then true would show up down here, or rather this last one here, instead of false. Now, something that you can do is you can nest your if-else statements. You could basically say if this, if this, if this, and this, and you can have a nice nesting of several if-else statements within each other. You have to be careful when you do that just to make sure you're coding it with good indentation so you could line up your if with else clause. But, you know, I've just got to say straight out, I, I don't like that. I think it's poor coding. It's, sometimes it's not avoidable, but I, I have this rule of thumb. If I'm nesting more than three if-else statements inside of a, you know, other if-else statements, I'm thinking I didn't think it through, and my logic is rather convoluted. And you know what? If my logic is convoluted, somebody else, meaning some hacker, is going to figure out my logic, my logic is convoluted and potentially hack my code. So a better scenario, instead of using multiple if-else statements that are nested within each other, is to go ahead and use the switch statement. Let, let me go ahead and stop. Let, let, let me get kill this one and let's let me bring up a new uh, notepad so we could check out the switch statement let me go ahead and put up an example of a fairly fundamental switch statement and then we'll go ahead and ex I'll go ahead and explain that so int x equals 5 and let me go ahead and say switch x and we open up the curly brace close the curly brace and then what I'm going to do is case let's say one notice the colon system dot out dot print line um, you uh, selected one Okay, put in the word break there, keyword there. Okay, case two. System.out.println. You selected two. I'll break it. And then I'm going to put in case five. System.out.println. You selected five, and then I'm going to go ahead and break it. And just let me put in this default here. ULT, I'll put in the default, and I'll say something like system.out.println. Uh, you must select a number. All right, let's go ahead and save that, compile it, change that to a 2, and run it. And you can see I selected 5. Okay, big whoop, right? Well, what's going on here? Here's exactly what the case statement is doing. The case statement evaluates integers. That is essentially the only legal uh, type that the switch statement can evaluate is the primitive integer or the int. Now, that means you can take advantage of something we talked about earlier, the implicit cast, where if you pass in something like a byte or a short, a car or an int, then it'll 
implicitly be cast into an it. If you pass into it anything other than that, like a long, a float, or a double, what's going to happen is you're going to get a, a compilation error. So I go ahead and I pass in 5 here. So I assign 5 to x, I pass in x, and now what's happening is the cases are being evaluated based on the the value of x. So it was 5, so that's why you select a 5. If I change this to 2, save it, and recompile it, and then run it, you'll see that I have selected, whoops, the wrong program here, 2. Okay, you select the 2. Now, what does the default do? Well, if you go ahead and put something other than what the case is a lot for, then it's going to go to the default. Like, there isn't a case for 15. So let me assign x to a value of 15. Let's go ahead and compile that. And I'm going to run it. And now the default, you must select a number, okay? Let's say between 1, one 2, or 5. So that's essentially how the switch statement works. Now some of you may have noticed I introduced a new term, a keyword called break. That's important because on the, on the face value of it, the break statement merely just breaks a Java statement. What happens if I remove this break statement is I will get what's called fall through in my switch block. Watch this. I'm going to go ahead and comment this out. Okay? And I'm going to assign x to the value of 1. I'm going to save, and I'm going to compile it, and then we'll execute. Somewhere in there. There we go. Execute that. Look at that. You selected 1. You selected 2. Why? Because I've essentially turned off this break, which means it evaluated the fact that x was equals 1. It does the case. There's no break statement, so it falls through to the next statement. Now, default was another special case. Default means if none of these evaluate okay, for equality, because the switch statement only tests for equality. It won't test greater than, less than, greater than, or equal. Only equality. If it doesn't equ uh, equate to any of the cases, then the default option is what is executed. So in flow control part one, we went over the two types of decision statements that I have available with Java the if statement and the switch statement. I hope you have found this informative, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.